Hello, everybody. Welcome to creating a plastic free future. Um, we've got about 120 people logged on and we have about 500 registered. So we're going to give folks a few more minutes to uh, log in and um, settle in and uh, then I'll, uh, I'll walk through some logistics and a uh, little background on the panel and then uh, we'll get into our panel discussion. And um, just super excited uh, to see this many people interested in this topic and thank you for, for joining us tonight. So hello again, and hello to all those arriving. Uh, while people are settling in, I'll just cover uh, a few basic logistics. Um, Fire Marshal has informed me that I need to remind you that the exits are in the back and the bathrooms. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, we are on a GoToMeeting platform, which may be new for many of you or different. Um, if you've been doing a lot of Zoom calls and that kind of stuff, uh, we find this is a very stable and uh, secure platform, so we, we like it for these kind of webinars. Um, but it's it is different. So it, note that you have a control panel, and um, uh, all the um, attendees are uh, muted. And then we have our panelists who will be coming on and off screen uh, as we uh, run through the evening. So um, uh, our staff will be pushing out some comments to you. Uh, through the chat box. So you can uh, click on that little chat icon down at the bottom of your control panel and you'll see um, the chat that they're pushing forward. If you wanna ask questions, and we do hope you will, um, you use the questions uh, function and that will send questions to staff, uh, Ecology Center staff who are uh, helping behind the scenes and will feed those questions to um, panelists. But we may also respond to those questions uh, in real time. Um, so use the, the questions function for uh, any interaction with the panelists or staff that you would like to have. Um, the chat really comes from us uh, pushing forward to you. So um, that's a little bit about how GoToWebinar works, just as people arrive. Um, we're now up to about 140 folks, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Martin Bork. I'm the executive director at the Ecology Center. I'm thrilled to welcome you tonight to this uh, exciting solutions-oriented panel discussion following up on the story of plastic. Uh, I hope you all had a chance to watch the film and uh, may already recognize me as somebody who, who was in the film. Um, we have an amazing panel uh, tonight and hopefully we'll have a really rich uh, set of presentations and discussions um, lined up to talk about solutions that, um, you know, the film really talked about the problem and tonight we really want to focus on the solution. So I'm really excited to get uh, to get into it. Um, I've already covered a bit of logistics. Oh, so the Ecology Center. We are a member-based organization, community-based organization celebrating our 50th anniversary. Uh, we're located in Berkeley, California. I think most of you are from the area, but there may be folks uh, from uh, other parts of the planet. Um, this is a free event, but as I mentioned, uh, we are a membership organization and it takes a lot to put these events together and to do the kind of work that we're doing to fight back against plastic pollution. So uh, we hope that you will enjoy the programming tonight and then consider making a donation uh, or becoming a member, and you can do that on our website, which is just ecologycenter.org. Um, and uh, we hope we hope you can give generously. Um, also wanted to let you know later on tonight, we have a, a retail store that promotes uh, all kinds of alternatives, but plastic-free solutions um, 
houseware products, um, you know, ways to avoid plastic in your life. Um, and that store is open with online ordering and no contact in-store pickup for people who live in the area. And tonight, for you, our special guests, we're going to give you a 15% discount at our store. And we'll give you a promo code to enter into the website when you're ordering uh, at the end of the, the uh, event tonight. So you can use that promo code uh, tonight uh, to get a 15% discount on anything you might want to order from our store. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the Ecology Center, uh, we're a community-based organization. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary. I like to say we were um, conceived in the summer of love and founded on Born on Earth Day, 1970. Um, the idea was that every community should have a place where people can come together, get active on local issues, get connected with other people, and um, really um, work for change. At, uh, and the idea was always to think globally and act locally. So think about the big environmental pictures and issues and concerns, and then work on things that are really practical and tangible right here in our community. And that um, is still very much our approach today. And then we take those things that are successful in, in the local environment and we help to spread them and we try to spread them and we share um, our ideas and our experiences. Um, obviously not everything we try is gonna work out, um, but lots of things have. And, um, you know, one of them was curbside recycling. Um, uh, early in the organization's history, in 1973, people uh, in and around the organization started the nation's first curbside recycling program. And, um, if you know, as you saw in the film, we continue to operate that curbside recycling program and its modern expression of that um, under contract with the city of Berkeley. And so we've operated the, the city's curbside program uh, for almost 40 years now, uh, or over 40 years, sorry, over 40 years now. And, um, and you know, recycling with the other nonprofits who started it in the early days, it was really making a huge difference. And today it's larger than the automotive industry but it has been co-opted to a certain degree by the plastics industry and the packagers and the large corporate garbage companies. Um, everybody has forgot that there's a reduce, reuse before recycle in the reduce, reuse, recycle hierarchy. And so, you know, we've got to really take back recycling and bring it uh, back to its original values and advance uh, real solutions, not, uh, not the false ones. So, um, Story of Plastic, you've seen it. It's an amazing film. Um, it, you know, it, it connects all of these different things. Um, it um, really does an amazing job of presenting the full scope of the problem and that the problem is a systemic problem. It's not a problem of litter bugs or dirty, um, irresponsible consumers. It's um, a problem of corporate America. It's a problem of packagers. It's a problem of the petrochemical industry and the fossil fuel industry. And it's one that they have uh, made a lot of money on pushing out to us and externalizing the many uh, costs and impacts um, to our air, to our water, to our food, to our ecosystems, um, and to our communities. So tonight, we're really going to focus on the solutions. And we have an amazing panel um, lined up. And we're going to start with work that's happening at the very local level in municipalities and in county cities and counties um, around around the nation. Excuse me. And then we're going to talk um, about state level policy and what's going on in the state of California. Really amazing um, work um, at the state, local state, and and then we're going to move up to the national level. And there has been uh, national legislation uh, introduced that is really quite comprehensive and really far reaching, and, and it's quite amazing to see. Um, how quickly um, the awareness around this issue of plastics has grown and then the response to it is is really also quite dramatic. It is the fastest moving issue I've been involved with in my career, nearly 40 years working on environmental and social justice issues. Um, so tonight, and, and then we'll go to the international level. And um, uh, I, at the time I got on, our um, Yuyun had not yet joined, so I'm hoping she will join. She's in a completely different time zone. It's 2 a.m. for her. So uh, hopefully she'll be with us to talk about what's going on in the international 
level um, uh, in, in terms of international waste trade uh, regulation. So um, we're going to start with Miriam Gordon. And I would like to introduce the panelists now. If you could all turn your cameras on and, and join us. Uh, there's Shane. Hi, Miriam. All right, Bonnie. Yuyun. Going once? Not yet. I know our staff is, is working behind the scenes to, to bring her on. I just want a quick shout out to our staff, um, Denea Shorter and um, Andrea Teneo and Erica Everett have done an amazing job putting this together and are working uh, to make this platform work for us uh, seamlessly, hopefully. Um, but our panelists are here with us um, and we're gonna start tonight off with Miriam Gordon. Miriam is um, Upstream's policy director She's an amazing lifetime leader on reducing plastic pollution. She is one of the lead authors and one of the forces behind Berkeley's groundbreaking foodware ordinance, um, and is now leading the charge to spread this approach to other cities around the country. Um, and um, she's going to, to talk about some of that local legislation and, and the organizing that Upstream is doing uh, to help support uh, communities taking back control over plastic pollution at the local level. Um, next up is uh, Bonnie Bennywell. Bonnie is a senior legislative assistant. You want to wave hi, Bonnie? Um, senior legislative uh, assistant, uh, sorry, senior uh, policy analyst at Californians Against Waste. If you don't know Californians Against Waste and you live in California, you should check them out. One of our leading policy organizations on, on issues of waste and recycling, compost, et cetera. I mean, she's driving forward a number of state um, statewide plastic reduction bills uh, in coalition with a number of other organizations. And um, she's lead organizer supporting uh, the Clean Seas Coalition, uh, who is working, it's a sort of combination of waste organizations and ocean protection organizations working on some really amazing um, the state level uh, policy. So she'll, she'll talk about the state level um, and then we'll hear from uh, Shane Trimmer. He's a senior legislative assistant for the office of Congressman Alan Lowenthal of Long Beach here in California, who helped draft the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And if you haven't heard about this, this is um, the most comprehensive piece of, um, uh, of public policy I've seen anywhere, really looking at addressing plastic from the wellhead to the pipelines, to the petrochemical plants and the frontline communities, to um, uh, bottle bills and bag reduction. I mean, it's just, it, it, and international trade, it's just really quite stunning and um, really um, courageous of you to take on all of these <laughs> opponents, basically pick the fight with everybody. Um, and uh, Shane is an amazing uh, advocate in, in that space. And hopefully, uh, Yuyun is Mawadi will join us. Uh, Yuyun's a senior advisor uh, and co-founder of Nexus for Health, Environment and Development Foundation, uh, formerly known as Bali Focus, an internationally renowned environmental activist and a 2009 Goldman Environmental Prize winner. Um, she uh, has been working on the international waste trade for a long time and has also experienced the deluge of plastic waste going to her home country of Indonesia and um, has just done amazing work to um, try and restrict international um, waste trade and you know, the, the dumping of waste from developed nations to, to less developed nations. And um, hopefully she'll be able to come and talk about the Basel Convention, the United Nations, other international processes. Um, so we'll get short presentations from each of them, um, five to seven minutes, and then a couple questions, and then we'll move on to the next presenter. And then time allowing, we'll have some more questions at the end. So with that, um, I'm running behind time already. So I'm going to hand it off quickly to Miriam and just say Miriam and I um, got to know each other really pretty well in passing Berkeley's um, single use disposable foodware and litter reduction ordinance. She was uh, one of the lead authors on that and just put in an amazing amount of time and energy um, critical to its success and is now working to spread some of the elements of um, Berkeley's ordinance to other communities. So take it away, Miriam. Great, are you seeing my screen? No, 
I'm not seeing my screen. We see your desktop. Okay. It was up a minute ago. Here we go. Okay. There we go. Martin, thanks so much. Um, I don't know how to move my control panel. I'm gonna move. Oh, that's what's happening. Okay. Well, you're gonna have to live with seeing my control panel, I guess. Um, this is annoying. Oh, I know. Try this. There we go. Okay. Looks well, great. thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, uh, I just wanted to, uh, I'm going to be talking about local policies, as Martin mentioned. I wanted to introduce you first to Upstream. Um, we're a national NGO that sparks innovative solutions to plastic pollution. But for us, the problem isn't just plastic. It's the throwaway culture. So we work to make throwaway go away through business innovation, policy, and culture change communications. Now, um, today, 65% of Americans are very or extremely concerned about plastic pollution. At Upstream, we share that concern, and that's why we helped launch the Break Free from Plastic movement in the US. Today, more than 8,000 organizations worldwide belong to this movement, which has helped launch plastic pollution to the forefront of public awareness. And from that awareness comes pressure on politicians to do something about plastic pollution. For the last decade, data about the sources of plastics in the marine environment has been uh, driving solutions. And the data tells us um, that 80% of ocean plastic comes from land-based sources, and uh, the majority of that, about 70%, is food and beverage packaging. The policy solutions to date have fallen into two categories. The first are aimed at banning specific plastic products and the other focus on how these products, how products are managed at end of life in the waste stream, like specifying that they be recyclable or compostable or even reusable. Um, but what happens when you only ban plastics? What's been happening is a transition to other single use alternatives. And these are highly regrettable substitutes uh, paper, it's responsible for the cutting of 3 billion um, trees uh, each year. Trees provide a host of environmental benefits, not the least of which is um, storing carbon. Bioplastics and fibers, this is made uh, with um, industrial agriculture that requires huge inputs of energy, water, and fertilizers and creates nutrient-rich runoff that creates dead zones in our waterways. Um, and aluminum and wood, also really significant environmental impacts. Um, when you uh, also specify that products be uh, recyclable and compostable, uh, these are also problematic approaches. Um, first of all, recyclable food packaging has lower environmental impacts only 56% of the time. In many cases, recyclable packaging actually has higher impacts than non-recyclable options. And even when foodware is made of recyclable materials, it's usually too dirty to actually be recycled. The China ban actually unveiled the myth that these products can be um, recycled. Most jurisdictions now having to deal with these products themselves are ending up sending them to landfill or incineration. We find similar problems with compostable foodware. It usually doesn't get composted most commercial composters, and this may not be the case in Berkeley, but most commercial composters don't want bioplastic, um, don't want any kind of food packaging. These products can contaminate their compost and reduce its value. So the truth is we're never going to be able to recycle or compost our way out of this problem. Um, and um, while plastic is a problem product, other single-use alternatives are also problematic. The real culprit isn't just single-use plastic, it's single-use itself. And it's time that we stop treating our planet's resources like clean water, air, and habitat as disposable. When single-use products litter our street, pollute our air and our drinking water, and destroy the beauty around us, we're really treating our communities as disposable. It's time to turn off the tap for all unnecessary single-use crap. 
And what we're doing is focusing in part, one of the ways to do that is focusing on policies that help us drive higher up the hierarchy towards reduce and reuse. And as Martin mentioned, we work together on the Berkeley Ordinance that was enacted in January 2019. This is really groundbreaking. It specifies that accessories uh, um, that come with your order have to be um, opted in by the consumer take out um, beverages that are in cups, in disposable cups that will now cost 25 cents to um, encourage the reusable alternative. And on-site dining can no longer be in reusables. This model spread quickly in the last year. Seven cities adopted in California and the city of Vancouver adopted the cup charge. And one, even Arcada, added a container charge. Four communities adopted the prohibition on disposables for on-site dining, and there have been a raft of other policies um, focusing on reuse in, at events and at uh, government facilities and even refillable bottle laws all across the niche, all across the globe. But what happens with what happened with COVID um, is that it becomes very hard to um, uh, imagine having any uh, changes, ch trying to change food service in any way or restaurants in any way. So what we need are a new uh, set of policies uh, during the pandemic. And what we are focusing on um, and promoting and working with local legislators on right at this time is focusing on the delivery services and the delivery systems. Almost all food service has moved towards a takeout and delivery model and the delivery companies are skimming huge profits off of um, the restaurants when they charge these commissions that could be between 15 and 30 percent of every order placed. Uh, so while these companies are making a huge amount of money, um, it is time to hold them accountable for the kinds, the way that they serve us food and beverages. So our policies are looking at, again, driving down the uh, quantity of accessories with every order, they must provide a reusable option, and the orders that are in disposables will cost more. Now, we can also start looking towards new businesses that open post-COVID and make sure that they're designed properly from the very beginning. And we're also um, looking at government facilities to, to be leaders, and uh, so our model policies said that they shouldn't provide uh, beverages in single-use cups or provide single-use plastic water bottles. Our, um, our method for doing all this is um, by uh, supporting the reuse movement and leading seating and feeding policy coalitions. So we lead coalitions in the Bay Area and we seed reuse coalitions that are led by other organizations in places like Los Angeles, New York, Honolulu, and we're launching also with uh, folks throughout New England. Um, so want to uh, thank you for joining us here today. And if you'd like to join Upstream in sparking solutions that create indisposable communities, please uh, find us at upstreamsolutions.org. Thank you. Now, what do That's I do great, I am. Thanks for sharing all your work and what's going on with um, all of these uh, communities around the country as they um, take on you know, not only uh, trying to reduce plastic waste, but trying to do that in a new context. Could you say just a few words about um, some of the things the plastic industry has done to uh, sort of shore up their position and sort of try and reposition themselves as the safer alternative um, with um, disposable plastics being safer than reusables? Yeah, well, the plastics industry uh, jumped in early on in the COVID pandemic and um, reached out to the to Secretary Alazar, the head of Health and Human Services, which oversees um, the Food and Drug Administration, um, and they came out with a strong statement. No, not strong, but with, with um, statements. Um, that plastics are safer uh, than reusables, um, that plastics are the safest material that we should, um, and they were citing some really specious science, scientific studies funded by the American Chemistry Council um, that were that are old recycled studies from the plastic bag ban um, wars, basically, and these studies cited um, 
elevated counts of bacteria in reusable bags, um, which has nothing to do with coronavirus. Um, and these bacteria, the levels of bacteria found in those studies were um, the same as you would find in your prepackaged salad uh, or uh, lettuce that you find in the grocery store. So really not a significant health issue, never has been. Um, so they were reciting that kind of science to say that plastics are um, safe, to attack reusable bags and say that uh, single-use plastic is safer. Um, and we see them, we see that they've been trying very hard to influence um, restaurant policy, FDA policy, but the fact is that um, the coronavirus lasts long, long on plastic as it does on any um, smooth surface like stainless steel or metal. Um, and But the problem is that that's not how coronavirus is spread. It's really spread through aerosolized droplets, not through surface contact. Um, so reusables are actually safer because they're highly sanitized and they go through lots of washing and they have to, and reusables in food service have to meet very strict food safety code. Um, so Thanks. they haven't been all that successful, actually. Well, I appreciate your work and, and uh, the coalitions that you've been leading to try and push back against some of this um, messaging and really reestablish uh, reuse as as the solution and the way forward and you know questioning um, the narrative that plastic is is safer um, particularly when they don't take into consideration all of the other impacts that we saw in the story of plastic clearly there are lots of other problems um, with plastic so is it really safer when you just are looking at this one narrow part of the the system we have another question from the audience um, somebody's working on a local straw um, uh, straw ban or condiment ban utensil ban and just looking for advice generally on um, how to uh, how to proceed with that or, or what what kinds of suggestions you might have for them um, well I think um, I think it's a great idea um, I, I think what we need to do as I said is uh, drive drive down all single-use products so um, rather than banning a plastic straw, go after all the ut single-use utensils and uh, go for a policy that um, at the that uh, says delivery of um, takeout and delivery should uh, have customers should have to actually specifically request all of those accessories because a lot of these deliveries just automatically come with stuff that you don't need when you're at your home or your office and you already have uh, your your utensils and condiments. So that would be my advice and feel free to get in touch with me because we are launching a whole policy campaign around opt-in for um, these accessories with the delivery uh, companies. Yeah, we'll have all the contact information for the panelists uh, at the end and in a follow-up email going out to all the attendees afterwards. So I'll volunteer Miriam and say she's a great partner to work with um, and can really help advise and give you resources. And they've got great toolkits. Uh, Surfrider Foundation also just came out with a great toolkit um, that uh, easy to find on Surfrider Foundation's website, really good for local municipal stuff. And Miriam can, can connect you uh, with all of that. And I'll just say we do have a model policy language for you to use at the local level for the, these accessories campaigns. So thanks a lot, um, Miriam. We're going to move on now to talk about the state level policy with Bonnie Bennywall. And um, we'll come back and do uh, more Q&A if we have time at the end. Hi, Bonnie. Oops, I'm on mute. Hi there. <laughs> oh, great. Welcome. So. Um, uh, I haven't had the pleasure of working with, with Bonnie on any of these campaigns, really, except on email and a little bit through video chat. So um, it feels um, weird to do an introduction when we actually haven't been in the same room together. But she um, is leading and really pressing for some amazing policy change at the state level. And um, so I'll turn it over to you, Bonnie. Please uh, tell us what's going on in the state of California. Awesome. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here, the virtual here that is, um, and really get the chance to discuss some of the possible solutions that the that this film has really exposed. 
Um, so as Martin mentioned, my, my name is Bonnie Benewal and I'm a policy analyst with Californians Against Waste. Um, in Californians Against Waste, we have been around for 43 years now. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization working on recycling and waste reduction policy in Sacramento. Um, so let's dive right in. What is California doing to address this issue that's plastic pollution? Um, so as many of you may know, uh, California was the first state to have a statewide single-use plastic bag ban back in 2014, which was then upheld by voters in 2016. Um, and then a couple of years later in 2018, we were the first state to pass a straws upon request policy. So these two victories, along with um, you know, a ban on plastic beads and a few others, there was definitely a lot of momentum in the legislature to tackle this issue. Um, certainly a result of growing public awareness and pressure. So, um, you know, after these bills, it was really clear that in order to tackle the issue, uh, we had to do it in a more comprehensive manner if we really wanted to put a dent in uh, the universe of plastic pollution. Next slide. So this came to us in the form of SB 54 and AB 1080 by Senators Allen and Assemblywoman Gonzalez. So these bills, uh, which are currently on the floors of their second houses, create an overarching framework for all single-use packaging products. So they require that all single-use items are truly recyclable, compostable, or reusable. And when I say truly, I mean uh, they're, you know, just being technically recyclable is no longer enough. Right. It doesn't matter what can be done theoretically if we're still seeing all of this stuff mismanaged, ending up in landfills, incinerated or in the environment. So what it really means is that there has to be someone that is willing to buy this material at the end of the life cycle um, and put, turn it into a new product. Right. So that requires that uh, this material is collected at the curbside. It's sorted and bailed and pro uh, processed into a new product. Uh, this bill would also create a statewide goal that the waste, so the amount that's actually disposed from single-use packaging and products, is reduced by 75% statewide. And it gives CalRecycle, the State Department, the authority to come up with the regulations to meet these goals. Um, and one of the other biggest provisions that I wanted to talk about is the establishment of recycling rates for different material types and forms. Meaning when selling into California, a manufacturer um, can only use packaging that has proven to be effectively recycled at uh, certain recycling rates that ramp up over time. So, um, you know, there's a difference between a PET clamshell and a PET bottle, right? They would have two different recycling rates um, because they're considered different categories and both would have to meet these certain rates and dates in order to sell in California. Next slide, please. So at the end of last year's legislative session, after SB 54 and AB 1080 were stalled for the year, a similar ballot initiative was undertaken. Um, this was spearheaded by Recology, which is a San Francisco-based waste hauler. Um, this initiative was really written to be complementary to SB 54 and AB 1080. It incorporates the same framework I was talking about that all uh, plastic packaging and products have to meet. Um, and <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and, and it has a lot of the same provisions, um, you know, including the mandate to be truly recyclable, compostable, or reusable, um, and gives CalRecycle the authority to meet those goals. Um, it does, however, go a few steps further. Um, it has a 25% source reduction goal. And this is really what Miriam was uh, speaking about and what Martin touched on earlier as well, um, you know, being at the top of the reduce, reuse, recycle hierarchy. So meaning not only do these items have to be compatible with our current recycling system, but they have to cut down the amount by a quarter. Um, it also bans uh, uh, EPS in foodware across the state, something that we have been trying to do in the legislature um, for several years now, but just really hasn't been, um, there hasn't been much of a political appetite. And lastly, and maybe most importantly, it also includes a funding mechanism to meet all of these goals. So it would assess an up to one cent fee on producers per item of plastic packaging and foodware. 
Um, and according to the Legislative Analyst Office, this would generate anywhere between one to three billion dollars, which also kind of gives you an idea of the scale of the amount of single use plastic packaging and products that we're talking about. Um, these funds would go towards a number of different things, including helping local governments offset their recycling litter abatement costs. Right, you may have heard that uh, recycling was once a source of revenue for, for local governments, but it's now um, a, uh, a, a cost to get rid of this material. Um, and so go to local governments, it would go towards developing and updating uh, recycling and composting infrastructure towards reuse pilot programs, environmental res restoration for areas that are most impacted by plastic pollution, and much more. Um, so this initiative is in a signature gathering phase and it looks like it's on track to be on the November 20, 2022 ballot. Uh, next slide, please. So lastly, I know I'm running out of time here. Um, I'll mention another big bill that's working its way through the legislative process right now. This is AB 793 by Assemblymember Ting and it, this creates minimum content standards for, uh, for plastic beverage containers. So uh, minimum content is really a key pillar in the circular economy uh, because it ensures that there's an end buyer who's willing to use this material and put it back into circulation in the supply chain, um, offsetting the need for virgin plastic. And as you can see, this standard ramps up over time, ending with 50% recycled content by 2030, uh, which I believe would be the highest requirement in the world. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, well, uh, that's all that I have time for, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Great, Bonnie, thank you so much uh, for breaking down these three really um, amazing bills. Um, we got um, a couple questions from the audience and I, you know, I wanted to start by asking you, you know, um, I've been following these issues for many years and been involved in several um, public processes that even Cal Recycle, the State Department of Overseas Recycling has put forward around packaging. And it feels like there's always like great energy in the room and like something's gonna happen. And then, you know, all it takes is one industry to peel off and say, oh, well, we don't really like this. And the whole framework sort of starts to fall apart. And, um, but this time it feels like these bills, you know, um, both the legislative and the ballot measures, they've got a lot of support and a lot of buy-in. What, what do you think is different and, how, and what, how do you feel about their likelihood of success or, or elements of them actually getting adopted? That's, that's a great question. You know, when these bills were introduced, we really worked on um, putting together a coalition of broad supporters because you know, legislators obviously know that environmental groups are in strong support of these types of measures, um, but we also brought in local governments, which have a huge stake in the game. Um, we brought on waste haulers, local businesses, um, and, you know, a couple different categories of folks. So legislators really understand that this is an issue that's, it's not just an environmental issue. It's just not, it's not just about the marine debris that you see. Um, as the movie points out, there's much more to the life cycle and many more people that it affects. So I think that has, you know, given us a lot of momentum. Um, as far as the likelihood goes, you know, if you asked me the beginning of the year, I would have no doubt that these bills would be passing this year. However, now with the pandemic, um, the legislature has been forced to cut down the amount of bills that they are hearing. And with a bill like this, that is so big and comprehensive um, and controversial, right? Uh, there's a lot of pushback against these bills from the industry. Um, so it's a little bit trickier now, but the authors are still committed to bringing this up in August. And um, as soon as we think we have enough votes, you know, we'll, we'll be uh, bringing up on the floor. And as far as the ballot initiative goes, um, you know, it was a really popular issue on the streets. Right, so when signature gatherers were out there, they would often use this initiative to draw in folks to then sign it, sign other petitions as well. So it was doing really well, but then again, the shelter in place um, policy, um, you know, took all, the, all, all of the uh, signature gatherers off the street. So we started a mail-in campaign 
Um, and that combined with, you know, got signature gatherers slowly coming back out on the streets as we started to reopen, the numbers are really getting really quite close. Um, I didn't mention this, but um, for the mailing campaign, we're asking folks to uh, print out the petition, uh, sign it and mail it in because unfortunately they do have to be physical signatures. You can't do an online form. Um, so you can visit camustlead.org um, to get the information on how to do so and also to call your legislator to get them to vote uh, for SU 54 and AB 1080 because it's hugely important that they hear from their constituents that they want to see movement on this issue this year and you can't wait. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, we're gonna have to leave it at that and move on to uh, our next panelist, but we'll come back with more questions if we have time at the end. So um, thanks Thank again you. for all your work, Bonnie. Um, next up, we're gonna have Shane Trimmer, but I just, well, we're getting a lot of questions, folks. We're thinking that right now is when the film would be showing. And um, so I apologize if you thought you're gonna be watching the movie right now and you end up uh, watching a panel about a film you haven't seen yet. Um, but I encourage you to go to the Story of Plastic website. Um, there are ways to see the film. Uh, you can also uh, see, uh, rent it on uh, uh, iTunes and on uh, Amazon Prime. Uh, it's up on both platforms. Um, and there are lots of ways to um, see the film through different screenings that are, are happening. Uh, also, if you want to screen the film in your community or with your friends and colleagues, it's very easy to set up a virtual screening. But the way the platform works is that you set up a screening, an event, um, and then they give you a link that's good for um, 24 or 48 hours. Uh, I forget, I think it's 48 hours. So um, if you haven't yet seen it, I really encourage you to go um, check it out. It's an amazing, amazing film. And, um, you know, uh, highlights people from around the world who are involved in this Break Free from Plastic movement. And um, what the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act was really take everything in the film practically and try and create public policy to address these problems. So um, Shane was a big part of that. He's a legislative uh, assistant to um, Congressman Lowenthal. And, um, you know, they have put together a, a really comprehensive piece of legislation. So um, I'll just turn it over to you, Shane, please uh, tell us about it. Great, thank you. And let me know if, if for whatever reason you can't hear me or can't see uh, this slide deck. Uh, again, my name is Shane Trimmer. I work with Congressman Alan Lowenthal. Him, along with Senator Udall from New Mexico, introduced the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act back in February. Um, this, uh, as Martin said at the very beginning, is the most comprehensive plastic uh, waste legislation ever introduced on the national level. And it's really all encompassing, really, uh, um, uh, you know, and, and as Martin said, it, it is kind of uh, uh, interesting that it's, it, it complements the movie in so many ways. And it ended up being that we introduced legislation at about the same time that the movie started making its rounds. So it was, it was a, a fairly serendipitous. Uh, it took more than a year for the senator and the congressman to really develop this legislation. And myself, working with my colleague, Jonathan Black, and Senator Udall's office, really went through a very iterative process to try to get as much feedback as we could to make sure that this legislation was as encompassing as the senator and the congressman really wanted it to be. And so that that started you know, way back in, in 2018. And then really, what we did is we put together an outline of what we thought this legislation should look like and should involve. And we, we put that outline out for a public comment period and took those comments back and want to thank everybody who participated in that, gave us their feedback. We took that, put the legislation into uh, a text and then put the legislative draft text back out there for another comment period back in December. And then, like I said, in February, they introduced legislation. Uh, in many ways, this bill is a uh, collection of best practices that we've seen not only locally, but at the state level and around the world. So that means that we did take a lot of what we saw states and uh, localities putting together uh, over the last few decades to try to begin to tackle this 
this crisis. That that includes banning plastic carryout bags and putting a 10 cent fee on on other bags, uh, banning expanded polystyrene, and um, making it less accessible to get straws and uh, uh, other utensils and making them available upon request. Now, this is the big part of this legislation is this idea of it putting the producers of this waste at the helm and putting the responsibility on them instead of the taxpayers to, to do the collection, making sure that they're doing the recycling and making sure that that cost burden is on them. And so by doing that, we put in this extended producer responsibility model into the legislation and that puts these, these producers at the in charge of being able to manage this this collection. Now, it is called the Breakthrough from Plastic Pollution Act. However, we handle all waste because you cannot just handle plastic in a vacuum. And so we handle it through all material types, not just plastic. And we require producers to um, come together and put together these uh, producer responsibility organizations to manage this waste properly. Uh, it would require a major investment in infrastructure and the legislation specifically specifically calls for um, them to make this rapid investment into this infrastructure. Uh, also, what we tie into the extended producer responsibility piece is the a national container deposit law. In California, you're very familiar with container deposits. It's very effective, as you can see from uh, this slide. And so what we do is we put a 10 cent fee on all um, bottles and, and beverage containers to make sure that we can get that material back. Also, the legislation calls for uh, um, uh, plastic beverage bottles to have minimum recycled content standards. And we specifically highlight what those standards are in the legislation. And then for other material types that the legislation covers, we require that the EPA with NIST put those percentages uh, in place. We also define what is recycling and what is recyclable and put a, a national standard on what can go in those blue bins. Now also a huge part of this legislation, it was so important for, for the Congressman and the uh, Senator to include this, is, is it bans uh, the export of plastic waste to developing countries. And as you saw, this is a significant issue internationally uh, uh, from the story of plastic. Uh, now, we do allow for some export, but it cannot be to developing countries and those countries have to consent to it and it has to be these, it cannot be mixed materials. Um, you know, and, and you can see just the devastation from these photos below from Indonesia as provided from our friends in El, with Al Galida. Uh, also, so important to uh, this legislation, what you saw highlighted in the movie, is it puts a pause on new plastic facilities so that the EPA uh, can update their, their water and air regulations to make sure that these new facilities and the existing facilities do not poison the communities that are around them. This is a very important environmental justice piece to this legislation. and. You know, we, we saw just exponential growth of these new facilities popping up through the Gulf of Mexico, even into Appalachia. So it was so important to include this in legislation as well. The legislation also includes provisions that address cigarette butts and electronic cigarette cartridges. Um, and it also protects state actions to go above and beyond what we highlight in this legislation. Now, the legislation uh, is continuing to make its way through the process, and we are continuing to uh, engage with all stakeholders and individuals. We are continuing to consider amendments and changes just because it's been introduced doesn't mean that we aren't willing to continue to have this conversation to improve it. And we're also at a process right now where we're trying to work with advocates, um, municipalities and states to to take some of the mechanisms that we have in this legislation and to try to introduce it and improve what they have at the state and local level. Now there's many things that you can do to to uh, support this legislation. You can have your representative or your senators become a co-sponsor, write to them, encourage them to do so. In California, you're, we're very lucky to have both Senator Harris and Feinstein on already, uh, but also you know, do everything that we can 
at the workplace, at home to, to minimize the amount of plastic that we use and to, to really promote what is happening already at the state and local level, uh, that either that be at the ballot box or um, going through the state, uh, state house uh, in the state legislature. And that's it for my slideshow. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Shane. That was um, super helpful. What an amazing piece of legislation. I mean, it, it combines some of the things that Bonnie was just talking about at the local level and things that uh, Miriam has worked, I mean, at, at the state level and things that Miriam has worked on um, at, at the local level and, you know, really leveraging some successes around the country and putting them all, all together, you know, defining what recycling is and what is recyclable is so important right now because all these brands want to claim their packaging is recyclable and in fact you know we find that much of it isn't and so um, you know the minimum content standards um, you know we can collect as many bottles as you want but if we don't have a place to sell them <laughs> doesn't doesn't matter or if we're turning them into something like asphalt who cares you know like uh, we really need that circularity it's got to be bottle to bottle we've got to get back to the original we got to put the cycle back in recycle and uh, this this legislation really does that. What um, you know, how's how's the industry response been to this bill, and um, how are you guys holding up? <laughs> <laughs> um, as as you hinted toward the beginning, you know, it's it's all encompassing, and so there's it, it really affects uh, a number of industries, and we've had um, you know from the very beginning engagement and so for more than a year we were engaging industry and stakeholder and that means international groups that means uh, individuals that means uh, environmental ngos that also means these brands that you recognize being you know on the beaches when you're conducting beach cleanup this means organizations like the um, plastics industry association american chemistry council you know and we've we've engaged with them all along the way uh, with that said, um, you know, some of them have pushed back to a higher degree than others. Uh, you know, American Chemistry Council and Plastics Industry Association uh, of are the only industry are the only groups that have really publicly come out in, a, in opposition. And I think uh, a big part of that is that, um, you know, Senator Udall, Representative Lowenthal, my colleague Jonathan Black in Udall's office and myself have really engaged with these brands to understand, to let them understand not only are, are we trying to improve uh, the, the, the infrastructure and the recycling system so that maybe we can get some of these materials back so they can use more recycled content in there like they claim that they want to do, um, but you know, it, it, can, it can help with uh, so many international crises right now like, like climate change and the environmental justice concerns, you know, and so this this is a lot more than just plastic. And I think a lot of people recognize that. And they also see the writing on the wall. Um, you know, uh, this is a very all encompassing piece of legislation, but it's not new. None of this is new. Countries in Europe are doing this. Provinces in Canada are doing a lot of EPR. And like I said at the beginning, you know, States and, and municipalities in the United States have been the ones here who've been leading the charge for so long, and it's really just about time for the folks here in Washington D.C. to be able to to do something. Thanks. That's a, a great segue to um, a question from the audience. Um, how how are your colleagues responding to this, and you know what do you what do you feel like the response in Congress uh, has been? It's it's been great. Um, you know, I think that we introduced this in mid February. Uh, at about the beginning of March, the world ended, as you all might be aware of. So, you know, the the COVID pandemic um, has taken 120% of our time here, and we've just been making sure that our constituents are being taken care of, and and uh, everybody has access to the protective equipment that they need. Um, but with that said. We have been trying to address claims by by industry, trying to build up um, you know, uh, um, single use materials during this time to cause confusion. But also, we've taken a lot of this effort to educate folks on the Hill. And uh, as of right now, I think we have 79 co-sponsors on the House bill. I think we have 
nine or 10 on the Senate side, you know, and so we're constantly growing that, that, that co-sponsorship here in, uh, uh, in Congress. And, and it's been great, you know, and I think that a big part of this legislation, at least right now, we didn't introduce this legislation thinking that this Senate and this president was going to sign it. So right now, really what we wanted to do was educate people, educate members of Congress. Um, and, and I think in a major way this has done so because if you were a part of any conversation around recycling or plastic waste and before this year, it, it went a certain direction and it kind of went to recycling as the solution and it extended producer responsibility wasn't brought up here. Whereas now you can't have that conversation here in Washington DC without having a conversation about extended producer responsibility. So it's really changed the dialogue in many ways. Yeah, thank you so much for that that work and, and for your presentation. Um, we're gonna move on to our next presenter now um, and we'll come back with uh, the time that we have for Q&A. Um, Yuyun Ismawati is a colleague. Uh, I'm just so thrilled could join us tonight. Um, Yuyun, are you with us? There you are. Wonderful, thanks for being with us. I know you're in a completely different time zone. I can't hear you, is your, uh, is your mute, are you muted? Yes, sorry. <laughs> oh, there you are. Hi, wonderful. Hi. <laughs> um, so Yuyun um, and I got to spend some time together in Geneva last May uh, when the Basel Convention, which regulates waste trade, was being discussed. And they were talking about adding some plastic waste, um, things that people have been trying to get included in the Basel Convention for decades, really. Um, and um, they were trying, they were having a serious conversation about it. And Yuyun was like my translator because I don't really know these international dialogue spaces very well. And she just pointed out to me the way that the US and the American Chemistry Council were really using um, third party states to try and manipulate the system. And um, it was really great to have somebody there um, who I could sit with and watch in real time what was going down as they you know, they, 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 the guy from the American Chemistry Council would go and talk to the State Department guy and the State Department guy would get up and go talk to the Marshall Islands guy. Marshall Islands guy would get up and go say, oh, our poor tiny island state, you know, we can't have regulation because we can't, blah, blah, blah. And then Yuyun turns to me and says, oh yeah, Marshall Islands, that's where all the offshore companies are that are pushing through tons of um, shady plastic trade right now. So anyways, Thank you, Yoon, for, for being with us. I know it's very late for you. We appreciate having you on the call. I um, also want to thank everyone for all their questions and keep them coming. Um, after Yoon's presentation, we'll, we'll have some more um, Q&A with, with the four of us. And Yoon's going to talk a little bit about the international um, plastic waste trade. So take it away, Yoon. Okay, thank you uh, so much, Martin. And thank you for inviting me to this event. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a, a bit of problem uh, logging in earlier. Um, okay, so to, to, to save uh, time and um, I, I would like to start. Um, uh, can you go to the next page, please? Yes. My name is Yu Yonis Mawati. I'm from Nexus 3 Indonesia, Nexus for Health, Environment and Development. Uh, our organization is affiliated to um, lots of uh, big networks uh, that you can see here. Um, next, please. So um, I've been asked to uh, share a little bit about Basel Amendment, and uh, I'd like to start with the uh, China's uh, intervention that uh, is a game changer for uh, plastic uh, issues, plastic waste issues. Um, in China, they started it in, in 2013 with the uh, Operation Green Fence that um, <clears throat> they tried it to introduce the new uh, regulations with the contaminant uh, uh, or, or uh, what do you call it um, uh, impurities uh, concentrations with uh, of 1.5 percent, and this is set a new standard of uh, plastic waste scrap because uh, to have contaminants of 1.5 percent in waste in bales in containers is not an easy job. And that's uh, affecting also the exporting countries. So for instance, in the US, 
uh, it, it, it affects your way uh, to separate your garbage at home and then the collections at the MRIF and then the traders and so on and so on. So, um, but, but this trend uh, has been accepted well by, uh, by China's uh, um, trade partners, although at the beginning there was a hiccup uh, and a long queue at the port with the new regulations. But, and then when they follow up with the national sword um, um, uh, policy in 2017, uh, 20, 20, 2017, and then introduce it to uh, the, the WTO that this is the new rule of China of doing business and affecting 24 items or commodities, then everything has changed. Um, because uh, next slide, please. Because after China introduced the blue sky with contaminants of uh, less uh, 0 0.5, this affects everything. Uh, so in Indonesia, we can show you some of the examples of contaminants more than 5% or more than 10%. Uh, there are lots of uh, mixed of everything. So from plastics to, to uh, paper and then mix it with metals and so on. And sometimes we find flags also and, and US dollars money, um, <clears throat> US bills, $5 or, or $10. Um, in, in, the, in the piles of waste that was dumped uh, in the communities by companies who importing waste from uh, the US and from everywhere. Um, <clears throat> in the picture at the bottom, uh, the three pictures at the bottom shows how one of the largest uh, plastic recycling companies in Jakarta, near Jakarta, um, they covered by um, in, in the film or, or coverage uh, in the plastic war film uh, of the PBS. Um, this is how they work. Um, they separated the plastic PET bottles on the ground first with the with the ladies who, who work uh, eight hours um, a day, but in three shift. Um, so they work 24 hours really. Um, and after that, they they follow it, uh, follow up with the belt conveyors um, um, selections and and to feed the machines and then. Um, turn it into flakes. But what's interesting uh, and, and struck me when uh, I, I dig the information about this company was that uh, there is an announcement um, for the, the employees uh, who work in the belt conveyors. They are not allowed to go to the toilet more than three times uh, during the eight hours work. So it's, it's, it's a precarious work um, uh, environment for, uh, for them. Uh, next slide, please. And next, next slide, please. And not to mention uh, the remaining of the uh, unwanted plastics has been dumped to the communities and then use it for um, either to uh, as the fuel um, to produce tofu or just to burn it because they want to get the, um, the metals um, uh, wires. And uh, we have several uh, reports that you can uh, access um the the first report on the left is the uh, to show and demonstrate how much um, plastic waste impacted the local food chain and we collected eggs um, we found um, in two villages in east jaffa uh, eggs contaminated with dioxins uh, which is with the high concentrations uh, only second after the uh, eggs from vietnam um, from the uh, Vietnam War site. Um, and then the second report on top right is the uh, global uh, shell game that we uh, produced together with uh, Basel Action Network. Uh, in this report, you can see um, that plastics waste that contaminated and confiscated in Indonesia has been returned to uh, the exporting countries. Um, there were about, um, um, in the case that we investigated, uh, there were about 70 or 80, 90 containers that's supposed to be returned to the US, um, but ended up only uh, 12 uh, returned to the US and the rest of them uh, ended up in other countries. And uh, this is also part of the, the negotiation business uh, between uh, traders. Uh, and Indonesian um, um, companies and um, my government, I think they didn't, go, didn't do a good job by returning it to the exporting countries, but only 
sell it to traders in the in the US. So uh, that's why it's ended up in other countries, but not uh, returned to the US uh, directly. Um, and the last um, documentation uh, you can watch also from uh, the, uh, the PBS uh, online, it's the Plastic Wars. And based on these uh, chronicles um, and negotiations in the last two years, um, next, next slide please. Um, uh, the world also and several countries also agreed to uh, follow China uh, um, a pathway to 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 have a new rules and regulations globally. So um, in, last year it was adopted um, uh, by 187 countries that the new rules to do business uh, has to be changed. And next slide, please. And um, this is also supported by um, NGO movement um, with the uh, signing of petitions in APAS and Change the Dog. Um, so these are just the milestones to show the development of the new uh, global uh, rules. Uh, you can see it later uh, next week. Uh, next, please. Um, yeah, so it will start from the 1st of January, the new regulations uh, applicable uh, to plastic waste trade. There are three amendments in the Basel uh, Convention, but maybe this is not applicable to the US because the US is not party to Basel. But um, this is good to know for you that, um, uh, that there are new rules. Uh, next, please. Uh, I will just skip the first and the second. Um, yes, just next, uh, go to the, uh, to the graph. Yeah, so I just want to explain. Uh, sorry, uh, the the right uh, the right chart. Uh, this is the new rules in uh, that will be uh, entered into force on the first of January. Um, so uh, before the the ban amendment, the Basel amendment, uh, there is no uh, differentiations between uh, plastics with hazardous content uh, with uh, uh, normal plastics or or, or non harmful uh, plastic. Uh, type of plastics and uh, with the new rules um, there are uh, three different uh, types of uh, plastics that can be exported and um, uh, depending on the level of hazardousness um, and uh, these uh, uh, new rules also um, uh, require countries exporting countries to send the notification to the uh, imported countries it's it's a good start that uh, the bill that introduced in the us uh, already um, uh, push for the regulations uh, for the export uh, to the oecd countries but I, I hope that this will also affect to the non-oecd countries next next please Yeah, so this is just to show the uh, the, the example. Uh, next one, uh, I'll show you the pictures uh, on how the, the new rules uh, uh, will be applied. So in the past, uh, it's only mixed waste uh, that traded. That's uh, created a lot of problems in, in the uh, recipient countries. Um, but the new rules will, will, will ask you to uh, have a separation. So this is the 1.5% example of contaminants. It means you still can have the cap of the bottles and some, to some degree the labels. Uh, and then uh, if the labels and the caps are removed, uh, it will become cleaner and uh, it will be even better uh, if you exported it in form of, of uh, PT flex or, or pellets like the, the right bottom. So that's 0.5%. Um, so this is going to be the challenge uh, for everyone globally because many countries now set the standard for 2%. Uh, next, please. Thanks to you and we're, we're running out of time. So if you can yeah. wrap up, that would be great. Yeah, so just go to the, the last slide. Um, this is just the new regulation in Indonesia. Oh, oh, oh just one, one more, sorry, the, the slide uh, with the list of countries. I just want to show you because you mentioned the Marshall Island. Yes, so this is the top five, the red, red uh, uh, colors are the top five countries. And as you can see that 2015, um, uh, the US is number one uh, exporter, exported to Indonesia. And then uh, 2016, Marshall Island comes second, came second, um, and then 2017 number one, 2018 number one, and then 
2019 uh, become the, the fourth. Um, so why is it Marshall Island? Because some companies use um, the address in Marshall Island and Indonesia recognize only the country of origin, meaning that only uh, the registration of the company that Indonesia recognized. With the new law, um, it, it, it's, it's, it won't be uh, happening. So only from the, the origin of the, the port uh, that will be recognized. Yeah, so last, just, just the last slide is that the, because of the mixed ways, um, um, sorry, uh, the recommendation page, please. Yeah, so the key is that um, maybe we can encourage the bill also not to export the commodity with nine zero at the end, because that's the mix of everything. And that is the, the entry point for the disaster. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. We can discuss it later. Thank you, Yoon. This is very helpful. You know, um, what I was able to capture when I was in Geneva with you was, um, you know, all this mixed plastic coming together is now going to be regulated in a way where the country receiving it has to give prior informed consent. And so a business yeah. in Indonesia can't just import whatever they want. They have to yeah. get approval from their government. And and yeah. also yeah. the um, that the facility where that gets processed has to um, have meet environmentally sound management practices, which have also been pretty clearly identified for this, this stuff. So those are big um, improvements to a waste trade that was largely unregulated. And yeah. um, you guys, um, you know, you've been very um, outspoken and, and helped with this return to sender program where um, bad shipments arriving in Indonesia, Malaysia, and other countries, um, they've been stopping them and sending them back at, at tremendous cost to the shipper. And uh, yeah. even, even without the laws or the regulations, that's a very strong message to the marketplace that you better clean up your act before you start putting the stuff on, on shipping containers. How do you see the, the Basel Convention and this new amendment, um, you know, it won't go into effect what, till January? Um, how do you see yes, it, it, it rolling out you know, over the next couple of years? Uh, I think it will take about two years for the uh, all countries to adjust with the new uh, system. Uh, I think um, on the 1st of January, although some countries already made some preparations, um, like Indonesia, uh, we are developing the, the Indonesian government now developing the roadmap, um, how to uh, respond to the new rules uh, of the Basel. Uh, but also I see that um, it's not only the, the importing countries that are preparing this, but also the exporting countries. The EU already uh, had a new um, regulations uh, in place, uh, what to send and what's the, uh, the definition of clean and the cure plastics and so on and so on. Uh, I think the US also have to be ready with this because um, uh, you guys sent all over the world. But uh, yeah, I, I guess that will be a hiccup uh, for at least a year uh, to adjust with the new regulations. Uh, unfortunately, in Basel, there is no uh, sanctions or, or, or punities for uh, violations and so on. So everything will be discussed uh, bilateral or, or bring it to the regional. Well, thank you um, so much for joining us and for helping us to understand the international trade laws. And we hope, you know, this will really make a difference. Um, you know, we started tracking some of our plastic scrap that was being exported out of Berkeley with GPS tractors because there was no regulation, there was no controls, and we had no line of sight to where the stuff was going. And once we found some things that we didn't like, we, you know, we said we, we should stop exporting those mixed grades, keep them in the country, or maybe we should stop collecting them. Maybe they shouldn't be part of our recycling programs at all. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, it's great to be able to connect that very local with, with the global. And I'd like to invite the other panelists um, to join us now. Um, we've got just about 10 minutes um, that we could have um, a few questions. Um, yay, there's everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your presentations, really great. And thanks everyone in the audience for all of your questions. Um, we've got a long list of questions and um, uh, we won't be able to get to all of them, but um, I, I, I kind of looked at a bunch of them and, and put a couple together and, and just 
Now, one question for this whole panel. Um, there's all this legislation happening and there's major outcry from consumers and, you know, the Twitter feed of Keurig coffee pods and, you know, the uh, uh, Coke and Pepsi have got to be just blowing up with people, <laughs> you know, telling them exactly how they feel about their plastic waste. How do you feel like this, um, the legislative efforts that all of you have been involved in in creating regulation or new laws or, or controls, how do you feel like the, the industry is responding to that um, with or without the passage of these laws? Like what's, it, what, what's the impact of that, um, just introducing them? Anybody have thoughts? I'd be happy to provide one perspective. Um, I think that one, you know, as a result of things like um, brand audits, uh, which break free, which the break free from plastic movement has been working on, identifying um, littered items by brand and identifying the top 20 brands in different regions around the world has really put a lot of pressure on the leading brands. They don't like having their logos associated with being a top pol plastic polluter. Um, and I think that's really had an impact, although I know many brands have had sustainability initiatives for a long time. We're seeing, at least on the reusable side, seeing a lot more engagement and a lot more innovation coming from the big brands. So, for example, just on single-use cups, for example, um, a few big brands uh, launched a... Um, something called the Next Gen Cup Challenge and, and provided and picked some winners for uh, single use cups that are sustainable designs, but also for reusable cups and have been putting some investment into um, helping to accelerate those forms and or those companies and startups. And, and then we're seeing, um, you know, Starbucks recently made um, a, a, a new commitment to reusables, uh, to promoting reusables. This was pre-COVID. And we're even seeing some of the big brands engaging with uh, things like the Loop system, which is really exciting, um, uh, where, um, uh, you know, Unilever and uh, some of the other big product manufacturers are now offering their uh products uh, delivered instead of uh, from the grocery store directly to consumers in reusable uh, packaging, reusable containers where uh, you just, you know, you get your Haagen-Dazs or your Crest toothpaste in a beautiful reusable container. When you, when you uh, finish, um, you have a return system and you get the product re-delivered in another reusable container. So there's exciting developments and I think a lot of it has to do with consumer pressure. Shane, I, I was just going to ask you, add to that a little more. I saw um, recently Walmart and Target put in $15 million to come up with a better bag or to get off, stop using all the disposable bags. Do you think that's impartially in response to the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act? Uh, <laughs> I will absolutely take uh, uh, credit for, for that. <laughs> um, you know, I think that, you know, conversations that I had at the beginning of this with brands and with different industries is very different than the conversations I'm, I'm, I was having in February and I'm having today. And I think that they it, it, very honestly are saying that internally they are having conversations that they're being really being forced to have because of legislation, because of consumer uh, outreach and, and advocacy that they didn't even think possible a year or two ago. And, you know, at the national level, when you put that kind of pressure on them, that's real. But when California, the fifth largest economy in the world, says that they're going to have minimal recycled content standards, they can't have something, they can have a different product in California than they did do in Nevada, you know. And so, so even at the local and state level in California, it's huge. And it's forcing them to realize that, you know, this, is, this isn't just this isolated thing that they can kind of quash with, ads and 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 put their power behind i mean this is a, a cohesive movement now that it, it's just it's too hard for them not to begin to address it and for them to go above and beyond what they might have done to be able to control some of that dialogue is what you're seeing a lot of um you know which is great uh, i would say that 
you know, we'll, we'll follow up in two years time when you make that, <laughs> that promise. Um, but, but also in the meantime, we're gonna continue to ensure that we can do everything we can to get these, these kinds of important measures. Bonnie, thank you, thank you. Bonnie, or you, you and you guys wanna weigh in on this? I'll just add another little wrinkle which is, you know, we've heard a lot of um, voluntary opt-in statements from the brands and industry. And, you know, really we've all been working on regulation, like mandatory, not voluntary. We've heard the voluntary stuff over and over. Do you, do you, do you see more, where do you see like voluntary versus regulated unfolding as you um, work on some of this stuff? Yeah, definitely, I can add on to that. Um, yeah, you know, the industry has really been bashed recently by the public and, you know, they're seeing so much more legislation pop up. So they have made these public commitments and um, especially, you know, say around recycled content. Um, and this legislation would really hold their feet to the fire. Um, and, you know, another thing is that they understand that the public is waking up to the reality of plastic pollution and that there has to be something done. So they're pushing alternative solutions, uh, false solutions. So we have to be really careful on, um, you know, what uh, be very um, careful about what they're talking about, which is chemical recycling, for example. I know that Gaia um, recently came out with an investigative report talking about what chemical recycling actually is, uh, really just plastic to fuel operations that are not sustainable at all. Um, so the industry, is waking up to the reality that they have to do something, but what the solutions are, we have to be monitoring. That's, yeah, that's so true. And Yuyun, I know a lot of these are the same brands in the US and and yet, or in Europe, and yet the options that they provide in, in um, Indonesia and other developing nations are often quite different than what we get here. I mean, we don't know anything really about these sachets, these pouches that all these products come in, but this is a real problem. Um, in Indonesia and Malaysia and Southeast Asia, India, um, and increasingly in other parts of the um, developing world. So how do we get some uniformity or like, what are your thoughts about all of that? Yeah, I, I just want to build on what Bani said before that uh, companies also uh, or FSMDs introduced the, the pledge, the new pledge um, due to the push from the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation for the New Plastic Economy, um, that most of the uh, consumer goods companies uh, pledge to reduce the content of plastics 25 until 50% by 2025. Uh, it's only five years, it's, it's very short. Um, but what, what we've seen is that, um, for instance, the introduction of chemical recycling to recycle sachet, actually, that's a heck of a job. Um, <laughs> to collect empty sachet. So in theory, it sounds nice to, to recycle sachet, but in reality, it's a pain in the ass because you can't, you need a, a huge amount of empty sachet to recycle and feed uh, the machine. And to collect empty sachet is more difficult to uh, uh, compare to the, the the sachet with, with liquid in it because it's easier to handle and so on. But once you discarded it, it's it's difficult to collect them all. And um, one of the examples, a good example in Indonesia is the Unilever program. So they introduced this in uh, 2018 and then they had the pilot uh, with equipment and so on from uh, um, Germany. And uh, they tried it out only for three months after that they gave up because they can't do this. I mean, it's it's crazy to collect empty sachet, I'll tell you, especially in developing countries, it's it's small, not the big pouch. Uh, in the US, maybe you have big pouch, is, which is easier to handle, but small sachet in developing countries for uh, especially um, low to uh, middle income segment market is uh, the biggest challenge. So we also ask companies when they pledge to reduce the uh, or replace um 50 percent or 25 percent of their content plastic content we also ask them whether they considering to redesign their delivery system because it, once i had a dialogue with one of the directors of of uh, unilever and they said oh we tried it for three months and then it failed because they i said uh, can you introduce the refill center 
Um, and they said, oh, it doesn't work in Vietnam and India and so on. I said, try harder because you change our lifestyle for 20 years. So now you have to change our lifestyle again for 20 years, you know? So, um, so they said, okay, we'll try. Now they started to introduce the refill center, but in the mall. And I said, still, it's not, it's not uh, you're not solving the problem because the problem is in the community not in the mall so yeah we have to keep pushing because if they can change our lifestyle in the last 20 years they should be able to change also uh, their business you know yeah i mean we often hear oh this is what the consumer wants the consumer wants is convenience well the consumer didn't even really know what a sachet was and most yeah. americans don't either sachet these think of like a juice pack you know, like a Capri Sun pack, but smaller, like ketchup size, um, and filled with shampoo or conditioner or dish soap or just about anything you can imagine. And that's how they're pushing their products out is in these single use packages that are just devastating communities. Um, yeah. and, and then the solution being chemical recycling, you know, they're calling it advanced recycling because they, they didn't like the chemical part sounded too toxic, which it is. Um, so they're going to call it advanced. I'm like, what is advanced about burning plastic? Like, there's nothing advanced about that. And these technologies are really old. So we got to be very careful about um, some of the false narratives and false solutions that are being proposed. And just get back to the basics. Reuse, reduce, reuse, recycle. It's not that hard. You know, we okay. just have to be committed to it. So I want to thank all of you for, for joining us tonight. I want to thank the panelists. Um, you guys are amazing. Um, we are just about out of time. I know there's a, a couple slides that uh, we're going to put up at the end if um, Andrea or Erica or Danae, I'm not sure who's who's running that, but we have a, a couple slides. Um, want to encourage you um, uh, in the audience to um, join the Ecology Center, become a member, go to theecologycenter.org and you'll see a big donate button there or get involved button. Um, if you're local, we'd love to work with you as a volunteer. Um, if you have further questions, we have hundreds of questions and we obviously couldn't get to all of them. Um, please email our help desk. It's helpdesk at ecologycenter.org. Um, really easy to get in touch with our staff. Uh, I know James Hosley was on the line tonight with us as well, does a lot of the help desk work. Um, and uh, follow us on social media. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, and uh, you can also subscribe to our newsletter. We put out um, a lot of really great content through our email newsletter. So get there and check it out. Um, our store is open for people in the area. So if you want to buy um, plastic-free things and solutions for your life, check out our eco store. It's ecologycenter.org slash store. And if you use the code PFJ for Plastic Free July panel discussion, PFJPD, at your checkout, you get 15% off tonight. So uh, for one hour after the show, starting right now. Um, so I uh, just wanna offer that to you. Um, uh, and uh, you'll be receiving as attendees, you'll get a couple emails from us following up. You'll get an uh, email with some more resource resources. You'll get uh, some more information about how to do your own panel discuss or your own screening. Um, you'll get information, you'll get a recording of the video. Um, and then uh, also a survey to help us uh, improve with our format and uh, and operations and logistics, et cetera. So um, please fill out the survey. Let us know how we're doing. And uh, once again, I want to thank all the panelists, especially those in other time zones. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, to be with us. And to all the folks who are on the call, really want to um, appreciate you taking the time out to uh, learn more about this really important topic. Um, hope you follow uh, along with the Ecology Center as we continue to press forward uh, on many of these issues. Those of you uh, who are here uh, locally in the Bay Area or in Berkeley in particular, um, you know our recycling contract is gonna be coming up for renewal. We'll definitely want your support if you believe in community-based recycling. Um, we need your donations and, and your uh, financial support. And um, we really want to get you involved in uh, the next rounds of, of um, plastic prevention that, that we can get going here in Berkeley. So um, please uh, reach out to us and, and stay in touch. And with that, I want to uh, just 
thank the staff once again for making this um, fairly smooth and, and painless for, for us and, um, and for all your hard work putting the uh, event together and making it a success. So thank you everyone and good night.